Hello, 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 everyone. Everyone, come on in and sit a spell. Listen, it's Pastor Mike, the senior pastor of New Birth Church, and I am so glad to be hosting our uh, video podcast today, Light Lunch, Light Lunch. So everybody, come on in, come on in, come on in. <clears throat> I have a little cough and a little sneezing today. The flowers are in bloom. The trees are blooming. The grass is growing. Bees are starting to fly around. It's allergy time. And uh, that's what I'm experiencing, just a little bit of that today. So uh, come on in, everyone. Come on in. Let me know who's here so I'll know who I'm preaching and teaching to and talking with today. Gloria Jones, good to see you again. Good to see you once again. Shared. See? Shared. She comes right in with shared. Y'all know what you're supposed to be doing, right? Everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. We all have a responsibility when we come into the building here for a light lunch, right? Everyone has a responsibility. We're all going to get to eat. We get to eat, but we all have to, you know, clean up, wash some dishes every now and then, wipe our feet, wipe our feet, wipe our feet which is a signal for everyone to share the stream, share the stream, share the stream. So that's your responsibility. My responsibility is to cook the food and serve the food. And all you guys have to do is wipe your feet, take the tickets as they come in, welcome everyone. You know, when they come in, when you walk in, say hello to everybody and they'll take the tickets and uh, make everybody feel right at home. If we have anybody who's watching from Outside of the Kentucky and the area, outside of Louisville, Kentucky, let us know. Just drop it in there. And, and if you guys see anyone from outside of our area checking us out live right here, well, y'all greet them. Tell them thanks for coming and hanging out with the Light Lunch community. That's right. All right. Kenya Jones is in the house. Kenya, we're still praying for you. Still praying for you. And, uh, Great. Gloria Jones says, share. Gila's all in the house. She's giving a wave to everybody. And uh, Evangelist is here. She says she wiped her feet. Let me tell you something. If y'all missed prayer this morning at 5.30 a.m., you might want to go back and check it because they were on fire this morning. I'm telling you. They <laughs> I, I said I might just need to replay the prayer for a uh, light lunch today. But they got into it, man. And I'm telling you, uh, the fire of the Holy Ghost came down in that virtual prayer session and everybody, you could tell from the chats, everybody was connected and they felt the fire of the Holy Spirit just moving throughout Facebook and YouTube. I'm telling you, it was fire this morning, y'all. It was fire. Woo. So y'all better catch it next week at 5.30 a.m. That's right. Get up. That means go to bed. Go to bed. Y'all got to go to bed. You can't stay up to 11, 12, 1 o'clock. Unless you're getting off from work late, I understand that. But last night, mm -mm. see, the flesh was fighting me. The flesh was saying, stay up, stay up, watch some basketball. And something in my heart said, man, you better go get in the bed at about 10 o'clock. So I got to bed. So I was able to get up at four this morning and I felt refreshed and ready to go. Got the prayer on. So go to bed. All right, this is what we'll do. Next two, go on and set it up now. Go to your iPhone or Android phone and then go to the calendar. Go to the calendar and go on and set the time for next Tuesday. Next Tuesday and say, go to bed at 10 o'clock so I can go to prayer at 5.30 a.m. in the morning. Right. So if you go to bed at 10 o'clock, I guarantee you will feel good. You'll be ready to get up. All right, so go on and do that. It was fire this, that's right, Phyllis Keelan, she was on there. It was fire this morning. Katrina, God bless you. Katrina, we're praying for you, man. I hope to see you soon. And I hope, I can't wait till you walk in and you come in and you welcome every, and everybody see you for the first time in, in a long time. They're just gonna be so happy to see you. And uh, I, I would be just thrilled. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to see you. All right. Harriet Hollingsworth says, yes, it was. It was fire. Yes, it was. Prayer was fire. It was all that. Simone says it was all that. 
Rosie, Sister Rosie says, yes. Good afternoon, new birth. Crystal says, yes, Marquita. Where's Marquita? I didn't see Marquita. Marquita, you slipped in here on me. I didn't see you. Marquita, she's one of our praise and worship leaders slash youth teacher slash AV slash parking lot duty slash cooking slash vacuum the auditorium. I don't know. She does a little bit of everything. I didn't see Marquita in here. But uh, my mom's in here. She says, hello, NBN, New Birth Nation, ready for lunch. Everybody's all up in the house. All righty, all righty, all right. And Sister Katrina says, yes, Easter. Amen. That's right. Easter is on the way. It is on the horizon. And Crystal Allen said, pow, pow. That's right. Uh, I think Evangelist Pryor got fired up when they were praying. And she says, yeah, I felt something in the Holy Spirit said, pow, pow. Uh-huh. She said it was, it was like uh, explosions popping off in the spirit dimension. And then everybody starts saying, pow, pow. And then I, I can't think of, I think Mama Nita started praying. She said something about, um, man, I can't remember what she said, but she said something about whatever you ask for in his name, something like that. Uh, you'll have it or something, that scripture like that. And then she says, whatever. And then she got to saying whatever. And everybody started hashtagging whatever. But it was, it was good this morning. Man, I'm telling y'all. Y'all glad to be with me? Are you guys glad to rock with Pastor Mike? Let me, mm -hmm. if you're glad to rock with me today, just, just hashtag rocking. Hashtag rocking. Hashtag rocking. Just let me know you, you're rocking with me and you're cool and everything. All right. Don't forget to share the stream. That's good. That's good right there. Look at that, y'all. Can y'all can you see that? I don't know if you can read that or not. Can y'all see that? Ooh. <laughs> That's y'all like that? Hmm? I know you like that, and you're not going to get my cup, Sister Ebony. Sister Ebony probably want my cup. Yeah, I got to get that for these sinuses. <sighs> oh, sir, how, that's what I'm saying. Rocking. Hashtag rocking. All right. We're rocking in the house. Timlin's in the house. We're all in the house. Yes. Yes. I'm going to continue on with my... Y'all like that cup? That cup was fire. Paula, Paula, Paula says, what does that say? Blah, 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 to Paula, autocorrect or something. I don't know. I don't know what that is. Y'all know I'm a little challenged sometimes. Y'all like my cup? I'll show you again. I'll show you again. I feel a hallelujah coming on. <laughs> Cornita says she likes my mug. That's right. Cornita loves my mug. mug. Cornita, I think she's a coffee drinker too, if I'm not mistaken. Amen. Yeah, that mug is fire. I got that mug from, I think it's, uh, I think it was Lifeway. Lifeway Bookstore. You know where they sell a lot of uh, trinkets and cups and other items. I think they were going out of sale over here in New Albany, Indiana. I went in. They had a big sale. I think I got that cup for 50 cents. That's right. Uh, Paula says, I was typing rocking, but my phone auto-corrected it to rock it. <laughs> right. Hey, you can rock it. That's cool. That is cool. That is cool. Tierra says, it's a dope mug. Tony says, my, that's my... That's my uh, Sister-in-law, she says, yes, I want one. And no, you're not getting mine, Tony. I love you, though. You can drink out of it when you come over. But uh, it might might help you get saved or something like that. I don't know. All right, all right. Listen, I am going to continue on with the teaching from, from last week. And I'm going to extend it. I'm taking my time. If you notice, I don't, I don't rush on Wednesdays because I feel like 
Tony says, what she said, I can't see. <laughs> All right. I might find you a cup, Tony. I'll find you a cup, I guess. I treat you so bad sometimes, but she treats me bad too. It's like tit for tat. We go at it. She gives me an uppercut, then I have to go give her a roundhouse, and then she'll give me she'll throw a joke at me or something like that. But um, I want to continue on with what we were dealing with on last week. All right, and so wherever you're watching from, we want to say welcome to you today to Light Lunch. Why do we call it Light Lunch? L I G H T. It's because Jesus is light. It is because Christians are supposed to be light. It is because the word is light also. And uh, so we are eating the word of God. We are studying the principles from the word, the values from the word, the, the spirit, the spirit from the word we're gleaning from. Hebrews says that the word of God is what? It is alive and it's filled with energy. It's working. It has power. So we eat, we feast, we consume the word of God because that gives us the sustenance we need so that we can go and do the things that we do on an everyday basis. We just don't come together, just become together. We come together because we glean. We glean from the word. We glean from one another. We, we, we pull from the fellowship, even the virtual fellowship that's happening today. We pull from that. All right. And so we have been in a series. If you've been following us, we've been in a series entitled A Heart for God. A Heart for God. God put that on my heart months ago. And so I'm still in it. I'm going to stay in it. Don't know how long I'm going to be in it. We're just going to rock in it and just enjoy the word of God and grow and develop and cultivate ourselves into what God is wanting us to become. Amen. Martina, good afternoon to you also. Pastor Harris is all up in the house. Amen. We're going to have a good time today. I'm telling you, I can feel it. I can feel it. All right. And so uh, we're going to continue on with our teaching from last week. And the series is simply a heart for God. And we looked at the scripture and we've been just gleaning from the scripture. It's the basis for everything I've been working out of for three months now. From Mark 12, 30, when Jesus was posed the question, which of the commandments out of all 600 plus commandments is the greatest? The person that asked him that was actually trying to trip him up. And so Jesus responded by saying this. This is the greatest. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. So this mind, the heart, the strength, um, soul, we understand that that means one thing, basically. It is the soulish part of a man, the mind, the will, the intellect, the imaginations, and the emotions. It's that deep part of you, the deep-seated consciousness piece that makes decisions, that has aspirations, that uh, that holds the compartment of emotions. We're triggered out of it. That's the part that God says, I want that. I want that focused on me. Because when you do that, then we said last week, God says, I want all of you so that you can be all of you, all that you have the potential for being. Yes, you can try to rock life all by yourself. Right. You can just go throughout life and say, I don't need God. Yeah, you can do your own thing. You will even be blessed in certain parts. Know the time I'm saying that you'll be blessed in certain parts of your life. You just will not receive the fulfillment of all you could become because the creator was not in charge. And so you decided to rock life all by yourself, which is, hey, that's your choice, because, you know, that's the thing about God. He gives you a choice. You don't have to give all of you to him. You don't have to give any of yourself to him. Jesus even said, uh, 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 come, into, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. All right. But he doesn't force you to come. It's an invite to come. He doesn't force you. He doesn't make you. Right. But God wants all of you. Why? Because if he's working in your life and he is navigating your life and he's being 
what Jesus said, your helper or your comforter. The Greek term for that, translated that out of John, simply means the advocate, the one that speaks on your behalf, the one that uh, nudges you from that time to time when you can kind of get off to give you a little information to get you back on track. It, it, it pricks your heart from time to time to do the right thing. It also warns you not to do certain things. And so God is there navigating the ship of your life to help you get to that destination, the destination where the seas are clear and blue and shiny while he's guiding the ship and you see the sun on the horizon and you understand that God is in control. Even when the storms come in life, God's in control. But if you want to do it yourself, hey, have at it, right? Have at it. And so here's the problem. When a, when a Christian doesn't yield over to God and cultivate a heart for God, what happens? Fear, doubt, unbelief will begin to accost the heart. Yep. Your own fear, your own doubts, your, your crit criticism of things, all of that will start working together with unbelief and it will begin to attack your heart. If there's even one segment or one facet of your heart that is trying to align with God, fear, doubt, unbelief will kill that. They're like little boxers. They're, they, they are content, uh, contentious uh, individuals. I, I say individuals but their emotions, their, their decisions, their concepts, their ideas, their ideologies, they, they fight against your heart. It's like little boxers putting on boxers, boxing gloves. And if a portion of your heart loves God, but if you don't give all of your heart to God, then you're going to have doubt, unbelief. All of that will begin to creep in and begin to fight against your the part of you that is trying to believe God. You have to yield all of it to God, all right? This was the issue with the individuals that we studied on last week. There were 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament, right? And one of them we decided to focus on called the Danites, the Danites. And they were an interesting group uh, to the point that um, we wanted to take it another another level, dig a deeper level, the, 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 they call it level two, in marketing, go deeper into the concept of who the Danites were. They were one of the 12 tribes of Israel, but when you study them out, and I started showing you scriptures last week, you started figuring out that this tribe had a lot of fear, had a lot of reservations, had a lot of doubts. They didn't have a strong history for wanting to do the things of God. God told the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is the map that you're seeing here on the screen, the 12 tribes of Israel, all of you are supposed to inherit some land. You have an inheritance, but you're going to have to go in and you're going to have to take that land. And the Danites, they seem to be kind of fearful. It's really interesting. They would not take the land. They wouldn't. And I believe that they had a fearful heart. And that's what I want to talk about for a moment. Uh, the tribe of Dan, a fearful heart. And I would almost say that in a lot of Christians, uh, they have characteristic traits of the tribe of Dan. Dan didn't want to fight. They did, they did not want to fight. They didn't want any contest. Matter of fact, when the scripture starts talking about them, it talks about them in a very, very negative uh, light. All right. I'm going to show you out of my Bible in just a second a scripture that uh, was really interesting. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 20, when the children of Israel were about to go into this, this promised land, and each one of them had their own plot of land. Look at the instructions out of Deuteronomy chapter 21. And uh, it's really interesting what God said he would do. Look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1, it says this, when you go to war... When you go to war, I like that. When you go to war, I like that. When you go to war against your enemies, when you go to war, when, not if. In other words, you're going to have to fight. 
Sister Kellogg, God bless you. Come on in, come on in, wipe your feet. Sister Kellogg, come on in here, Yolanda. I love you. Come on in here. God says, when you go to war, are you hearing me, Yolanda? When you go to war, he then says, you might go. When you go to war, and you're going to go to war, not against your family members. Man, this is a whole teaching here. Not against your cousins, even though they get on your nerves. Not against your brother-in-law, Sister Tony Bowman. You don't fight against your brother-in-law. You don't fight against your cousins. You don't fight against mom and dad. When you go to war against your, your personal, personal, y'all. Are you seeing this? You are spending too much time fighting against family members when you have real enemies out there. That's a word for some of y'all. Some of you need to go back and ask for forgiveness from your family members. Aunt Helen's in the house. From your family members because they are not your enemy. You have enemies, but they're not your enemy. Okay? God told the Israelites right before he gave them the land. I just showed you on the map. He says, when you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, which lets you know, come on, y'all. That every time you fight against the enemy, the enemy is always going to look more powerful than you. Mark that, mark that down as a side note. You will never go to war with a true enemy and you will look like you're going to win on the onset. That's a word. That's a word. If you're fighting an enemy and you can beat them, that's not your enemy. Because you have control over the situation. That's not your enemy. Your enemy always has more power, more might, more strategy. They look more intimidating than you. All right? Is this good? When you go to war against your enemies and see, you'll, you'll start seeing their what? This is what makes people get afraid. You see their horses. You see their money. You see their chariots. You see their technology. And an army that is, ooh, there it is. Bigger than yours. The enemy always has something larger than yours. Amen. The enemy always has something much larger than yours. And I'm telling you, listen, I tell you the truth. If you get in here and you start reading this word, what you will start, you'll start re recognizing is this. You will recognize that God is not only on your side, but he will help you and he will push you through. He will push you through the chariots. He will push you through their money. He will push you through their horses. He will push you horses, power, chariots, representative of uh, a modern day technology, something that is strategic, something that is smarter than you. A chariot in ancient times was technology. It was technology. Because a chariot could pr protect the rider. A horse spoke of power. The horses drove the technology. It always looks bigger than you. Can I get a big amen, somebody? It always looks bigger and badder than you. All right? And so let me keep going. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. That's right. God will help you and push you through. Do not be afraid of them. Because the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you. Look at two. When you are about to go into battle, the priest shall come forward and address the army. Can I say something, everybody? My chat just jumped off my screen and it reset, so I can't see anything. It's going to take a minute before I can see anything. Uh, and, and when it refreshes, I won't even see the old chats. But get this. <clears throat> when you are about to go into battle, the priest shall come forward. Ah, that's good right there. The priest needs to come forward. In other words, before you go into battle, are you praying? Are you praying before you go into battle? Are you seeking spiritual counsel before you go into battle? Are, are, you, are you with me, people of God? Are you seeking spiritual counsel before you go into battle? I hope I said that right because Pastor Ruth will correct me. If you are not seeking spiritual counsel when you go into battle, you are not going into battle correctly. When you are about to go into battle, verse 2. The priest, the priest shall come forth and address the army. You need to hear from God before you start fighting. 
Never fight a fight and you hadn't heard from God. Never relocate to another city and you hadn't heard from God. Never marry someone and you hadn't heard from God. Watch this. Don't even buy a house because you don't know all the intricacies involved in that house. You don't know if it has flooding on certain days or certain times in July, the foundation cracks in the different kind of way. You would never see that at first. Pray before you even buy a house. Yes, that's what I said. It says, when you are about to go into battle, the priest shall come forward and address the army. And he shall say, here, Israel, today you are going into battle against your enemies. Don't be faint hearted. That's what we're talking about. You got to fight against fear. Don't allow fear to intimidate your heart when you are launching out to do new things. Don't, don't allow fear to do it. Fear, you're going into battle against your enemies. Look at three. Do not be faint hearted. Do not be faint hearted. Do not be faint hearted. I love this. Do not be faint hearted. I hope this is resonating with some of you. And don't be afraid either. Do not, and this is some of you all, you all know y'all do this. Do not panic. Y'all panic or be terrified. Now you will sit here and you will listen to me teach this word and you will say, amen, hallelujah. That's right. That's right. And this tonight, as soon as some trouble come, you'll forget everything you just you were just taught. <laughs> you will forget everything you were just taught. But I need you to embrace what you're being teaching right taught right now. Look at this. I'm going to go up to verse four, and I'll stop there. Verse four. Uh, verse four says this: For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. You you get that? God is the one is going, he's going with you to fight for you against the enemy. Are you hearing me, people of God? He's fighting against your enemy. He's fighting for you. He's on your side. Why? Not just to be fighting. God doesn't get into any fight unless the end game is to win it. Ooh, aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. God doesn't enter a fight, number one, that he can't win. Number two, he won't enter a fight with you with any other objective outside of victory. And this is one reason why with Dan, the tribe of Dan, they didn't want to fight. They didn't want to get other. This is one reason why it's so important to have God in the driver's seat. Because when he's not in the driver's seat, you are not guaranteed victory. Uh-oh, I, I need to. I'm going to say that again for some of you who just, just got on here and you need to see my cup. I feel a hallelujah coming on. I'm going to say it again. God doesn't enter a fight unless the objective is to win. He never enters a fight to lose. That's not how he works. And so when you are fighting by yourself, the odds are often against you. Remember, your enemy is going to have horses and chariots. They're, they're going to have power, technology. They're going to have strength. They're going to have connections on your job. You're trying to get another position on the job, but someone else who is really coming on against you like an enemy, they have connections that you don't have. They have horses and chariots. And so, but you want to fight it yourself. Well, you're already behind. The odds are already against you. And God says in the word right here, just look at it. it says, for, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies. Why? What's the objective? To give you a win, baby. To give you that three-pointer at the buzzer. Bah, right when the enemy thinks he's won. He's celebrating. He's, he's victorious. He's up one point. And then God comes down. He spins around. He dribbles behind his leg. And he shoots a half-court shot. And he smiles and winks at you before it even goes through the basket. Because he knows it's going through the basket. He knows he's already, it's, a, it's a done deal. It's over. Fight's over. Game over. God wins. Game over, God wins. God has to be in the driver's seat. 
God has to be in the driver's seat. Now, Dan, Dan got this, these words I just read to you, the instructions that God gave his people. He says, don't worry about their horses and chariots. They're going to look more intimidating. They're going to look uh, powerful. They're going to look overwhelming. Don't worry about it. I'm fighting with you. I'm going to fight with you to give you the victory. That's right. The problem with this is that Dan heard it, but didn't heed to it. How many times that we, we hear this word coming over the pulpit that you are more than a conqueror and then you go home and you try to conquer by yourself without God. There's no guarantee of success that way, people of God. You are not guaranteed success if you go by yourself. All right, you are not guaranteed success. You, you, you're more likely guaranteed to fail. More than likely, you're guaranteed to fail, unfortunately. All right. Here's some facts about the tribe of Dan. Talking about a fearful heart, and we're looking at the tribe of Dan. I don't want you to have characteristics of the tribe of Dan. The Danites, they were second largest tribe. Judah was the first largest tribe. We see that in Numbers chapter 1. Verse 38 through 39, we read this last week. They were the second largest tribe. They were positioned in a position of leadership. The tribe of Judah right there, I think it's on your right. You see the tribe of Judah, it is facing the east. This is the way, this is where the sun rises. And the temple always faces the east. And Dan is on the north. The north symbolizes going up upward and Dan is right there. So you have your number one tribe in the front and you have your number two tribe on the north side, which always is representative of going upward, northward. Okay. They were the second largest tribe. They had lots of respect amongst the children of Israel. Lots of respect. Here's the next thing. The Danites, when they marched, when they went into marching formation, Judah went first, but the Danites were behind. Why? Because they were the second largest tribe. They were impressive looking. Uh, they, they didn't look like chumps. God put them, watch this, God put them in a position of power and authority. He put them in a position of power and authority. All right? So they were to guard the rear when they were marching. Here's another thing. But when it was time for them to get the land, and I'm going to take you to the scripture here in Joshua chapter 19. When it was time to go into the land, oh boy, did they not do what they were supposed to do? Mm -hmm. They most certainly did not. Kind of reminds us of, of us sometimes when we do not listen to God and we operate in fear and we don't have a heart of God. Our unbelief, our doubt, our fears all come against us. Unbelief, doubt, fear begins to fight our hearts. In Joshua chapter 19, what you're going to see, let me see if I want to look here. Check out 18 here. First, let's see. Okay, yeah, this is what I want to I'm going to show you this one first. In Joshua chapter 18, Look here, Joshua chapter 18, verse 1. Here is the narrative where seven of the tribes had not yet taken their territory. Manasseh had, I think Ephraim pretty much had, and some of the other ones that had, but seven hadn't. And Dan was within the ranks of the seven. I just need you to get this down. Dan was in the ranks of the seven who had not taken their land. The other, uh, what, five did. They had taken their land. So, and I'll just read a little bit here and I'm going to kind of scroll. The whole assembly of the Israelites gathered, gathered at a place called Shiloh and they set up the tent of meeting. This was the tabernacle. The country was brought under their control, but there were still seven Israelite tribes who had not yet received their inheritance. And so the leader told them, said, how long will you wait before you begin to take possession? How long will you wait before you begin to take possession? 
That's a word. We can preach that right now. How long are you going to wait before you begin to take possession? This is good, y'all. How long? That's the question mark. How long will you wait before you begin to take possession of the land? That's the question for you today. You've been operating in fear, some of you. There are things that God has placed in your heart that you have tried and it failed, seemingly failed. You have to ask yourself the, the question, did I go with God? Did God lead the way? Did God tell me to do this? Did he, did he navigate the course for me? Or did I just go head first into it? I didn't pray about it, didn't seek his instruction, didn't get spiritual counsel. We read it in Deuteronomy chapter 20. Uh, and verses one through four, just a minute ago, before you go to war, always go to the priest. Always check with God. Go with the ultimate high priest, Jesus Christ. Talk to him. Talk to your spiritual leaders. Talk to a pastor, a deacon. Talk to someone who you know has their fingers on the pulse of God. How long, verse three, will you wait before you begin to take possession? of the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors has given you? That's the question. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you down and we're gonna look at each one of the seven tribes. So don't get dizzy when I, when I go through here. Verse seven, the Levites, remember, they did not get a portion. The Levites, they were a tribe, but they didn't get a portion, why? Because they were the priests. They were the priests. The priests didn't get up the same inheritance that the regular people got. The priests got plots of land, small plots of land that were near the tabernacle. Why? They needed to live near the temple. They needed to minister to the people. They needed to offer the sacrifices. They needed to clean the temple. They needed to give counseling. They had to give directions and instructions, the flow for the temple and the tabernacle. They were involved, kind of like Pastor Ruth and me. We're involved in the ministry. We get paid through the ministry. You all get the inheritance out there. You bring in, Ruth and I eat the fruit of what y'all bring in. That's scripture. That's how it works. It ain't no secret. When people say, well, all the pastors want your money. No, but does the pastor need? Yeah, he got to eat too. All right. The Levites, do, they don't get a portion among you because the priestly service of the Lord is their inheritance. In other words, serving at the temple is their inheritance. So they get their reward for serving at the temple. Does that make sense, people of God? Lakeisha James, God bless you. Does that make sense? So when people start talking about the pastor, all they want is your money. No, but they need to eat. They got to eat, doggone it. Or you won't have anybody in that position. <laughs> it's not fair. For y'all to go out here and kill it and slay it on your businesses, on your jobs, get your degrees and go out here and make all this money and buy these big houses and stuff. And then y'all don't bring nothing to the temple. Come on, brothers and sisters. Desmond, God bless you, man. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You can't have Pastor Mike in there starving and y'all coming in there wanting the word every week and he can't feed Ruth. Especially if you're doing, if the pastor's doing a good job or the leader's doing a good job, you definitely want to take care of them. Amen. I'm just teaching. And watch this. The Levites, however, don't get a portion. Now, watch this. I'm going to go, let's scroll a little bit more. Um, here we go. Okay. We, we have seven. Remember, we have seven who hadn't taken their land. Now, verse 11, Joshua chapter 18, verse 11. The first lot came up for the tribe of Benjamin. I'm not going to read all of this. I just, I just want you to see the tribes. And I want you to see how they begin to take their territory. And I want you to see that some of them fall and they didn't exterminate everyone all at once. But we're going to get to Dan and you're going to see something different about Dan. All right. So Benjamin, they got their allotted territory. Their allotted territory lay between the tribes of Judah and Joseph. And it starts giving the boundary and all that. So don't, don't look at my screen too much. I'm going to kind of go through here. I'm trying to get to the next tribe. All right. Now you have Simeon. The second lot came out Simeon. That's the second lot. Okay. Simeon. And that's the territory that Simeon was supposed to take over. All right. You see all the places here. Uh, again, don't get seasick while I'm moving the scripture. 
Verse 10, you have Zebulun. That's the third one, right? All right. And you see his territory. Then you have Issachar. That's the fourth. All right. Then you scroll down, you have Asher. Fifth. Scroll down again. Naphtali. That's six. They got their lot of land. Here we go. Here's the last one. Dan, the second largest tribe, the intimidating, the most inti one of the most intimidating tribes. Dan got their territory. Dan got the territory, right? But I want you to notice something. Here's a side note about Dan that's not in here about any other of these other tribes. Look at this. Verse 47 says, when the territory of the Danites was lost to them. In other words, as soon, basically, as soon as they got their territory, they went in it, the enemy took it from them. You don't read that about no other tribe. No other tribe will you read that about. Now, you will read about tribes going in fighting and not totally annihilating the enemy. And then you will read about some tribes who didn't annihilate the enemy, but they made, the en they made their enemies subjected to them and turned them into slaves. You will read about that, but you will not read about this narrative for any of the other tribes. Dan lost their territory. They went up and attacked Lisham. So Dan lost their territory. Then they went up and then they attacked another area. I'm going to show you. Pastor, what are you talking about? Let, let me show you this. This is crazy. Here's, here it is again. The day nights. All right. Maybe I should show you here. I should show you here on my iPad where I can draw like I did last week. Do y'all enjoy it when I draw on the screen? Does it make it a little more um, attractive and teaching? Because a lot of people are visual learners, not just audible learners. They're visual learners. And I am pulling up the slides here on my iPad so I can... Um, a draw on the screen here, all right? But you will notice Dan is green and it's right above Judah on the left of Judah, right there on the left of Judah. And uh, let me see here. I think this is the one. Hopefully that's the one. They have a very small area there. Now remember, they're the second largest tribe and look at the green. It is smaller almost than Zebulon. And they're, they're very small tribes, extremely small tribes. That is telling you something, people of God. It is telling you, here it is on my screen. Okay, I'm going to cast this up here and see if I can get this look going for you. All right, all right. There you go. Boom. There we go. Good. Check this out, people of God. There we go. Here's Dan. See this territory right here? This is Dan. All right. That territory is very small. Too small. Too small for the number of people that they have. It's just too small. They were supposed to have this territory down here. It says Philistine territory. They were supposed to be taking this territory in this area. Why? Because they're a huge tribe. And I'm thinking they're supposed to even go even further down. Because if you know that Judah was the largest tribe. And inside of Judah, you had Simeon. They set up inside of Judah. Okay. But Dan needed all this space. The enemy, watch this, relegated Dan to this small area. I'm preaching now. When you are fighting against the enemy, can I tell you something? You cannot be politically correct. You cannot be PC, politically correct, where you try to be nice to an enemy. Your enemy, your real enemy, Satan, all right, he is not trying to be nice to you. He's not trying to give you a spanking. He's not trying to inflict just a little bit of pain upon you. His job is to steal from you, to kill and totally annihilate you. 
All right. We need to get that in our heads. We need to get this in our heads. And until you get that in your head, you will never see God as God because you will think that you can do this on your own because you will, you will fall into this politically correct society that we have where you try to make friends with everyone. Yeah, you try, but real enemies don't want to be your friend. Please get that and make that register. Real enemies don't want to be friends. For instance, and maybe this is a bad illustration, and I will repent for it if I feel like I'm not saying it the right way. The Israel against the Palestinians, there's a lot of debate on who's right and who's wrong. Uh, Phyllis, my cousin, she was asking me about it. I said, Phyllis, if you go back through our history, you will see that they have been fighting for over 2,000 years. You're just now seeing a lot of it because of the news cycle and Twitter and Facebook, and we get news real quick and people take pictures and it goes throughout the world in seconds. So we see the horror of war. They have been doing this stuff for years. And so people say, well, why don't they make peace? You want to know why they don't make peace? Because they don't want to make peace. They are called enemies. They are called, y'all, enemies. That's why they call enemies. They don't like each other. And both sides know that if one side plays too nice and get too soft, the other side is going to take them over. Both sides know that. That's why they're both trying to annihilate the other. So we sit back in America drinking our Folgers coffee, eating our cheese Danish, with a side and a spruce of yogurt and talk about how their leaders should handle their countries. Well, what you don't understand is, is that they are enemies. Does that make sense? Rhonda Thornton, God bless you, Rhonda. Lord, love you, honey. I don't, I, I know you don't want to hear that. And it's not the politically correct answer because the politically correct answer is, we sing Kumbaya. We gather around the fire, fire pit. We sing Kumbaya, right? We, we hold hands in a circle and we just swing back and forth while we sing Kumbaya. Can I tell you something? That ain't the real world. And when people say things like that, it lets you know how far off mentally they are. They don't understand that there is a such thing as a good power and an evil power. And I'm not saying that about either one of the countries. That's not what I'm, that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that there's, there are forces, spiritual forces also in the world that is contending against one another. You have God against Satan. And in your own special life, God has ordained, Rhonda, for you to position yourself in such a way and there are certain things that God has ordained for you to take control over and to have, but the enemy is going to fight you tooth and nail to stop you. How much time do I have? Because this teach, that's all right. I'm just going to carry it on into next week. Because listen, the enemy doesn't want you to take the territory. Look at the map again, people of God. Look at the map again. Here's Dan. They were the second largest tribe. They should have had all of this, but the enemy relegated them and squeeze them in this space. They squeeze them in the space. And as, as I stated a minute ago, when we read in Joshua, I just showed you in the word where the scripture says, instead of them taking this land, they then did this. They retreated, follow me people of God. They retreated Northeast up to this area. God didn't tell them to go there. They took over this area. They slaughtered people in this area. Isn't that funny? They went up there and slaughtered these people. Can I tell you something? They beat people who were peaceful people. They were not warlike people. That's why the people got slaughtered. They were not warlike people. Isn't it amazing how Dan should have been fighting these people, but they were too afraid. So they went north, east, all the way up here, they sent spies up here to spy out the land. I, I can read it next week. I don't have time today. They spied out the land in this area, found out these people were weak, 
did a whole lot of treacherous things, wore these people out and took this land and then called it Dan. That, that is not what God told them to do. It's, it's flat out not what God told them to do. I don't know, I don't know how else to say this. Had they fought, God says, don't be afraid. And I'm telling you, and I'm going to be telling you this, I don't know for how long, because some of you need this. You can't hear a message one time and then go away from it and just think that you're going to have it. No, you have to hear it. It has to penetrate your ears, has to get in the eye way, the ear way. You have to start speaking it. God is with me. I will not fear. He is going to cause me to be victorious in battle. You have to start making those declarations and confessions. And it's not manifesting stuff out of the air. You're manifesting what the word said in Joshua. That's what you're manifesting. You're bringing that to pass. And so the tribe of Dan didn't do that. They ran. They were the second largest tribe and ended up running. And then slaughtering the people who were not even their enemy. That's not God. How many times have you seen people take down innocent people? Take down people who could not defend themselves. I'm preaching now. And, and the people they took down, they looked over them as though they did something. But real enemies they're afraid of. Ooh, that's a word right there. That's a word right there. That is a word right there. Don't, don't be like that. Don't be the person that God says, I need you to do X, Y, and Z, and you're so afraid of it. So you run and you go do something else. And then you conquer that and act like you've done something. Ooh. Ooh. Don't do that. Elder Pryor, God bless you, sir. Katrina says delusional. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Katrina. She says it's delusional. Don't be like the Danites. Next week, we're going to talk about Caleb. We're going to look at Caleb. Caleb, how he how he went into the land and what he did. We're going to look at some of the other tribes, how they went into the land and what they did. We're going to look at it next week because I'm trying to build your faith to go to the next level. I don't want to just talk about it. I got to build your faith. I'm, I'm the priest at the tabernacle. I'm ministering right now at the tabernacle. I'm getting the people of God together. I'm getting all the tribes together. I'm preaching the word of God. I'm speaking life. I'm speaking truth into your circumstance. Some of you have friends who need to hear this message. Go get the timestamp. Do whatever you need to do. Tell them, hey, girl, you need to go. Pastor War was all up in your stuff today. You need to go to this part of the program and listen to it. I promise you, you will be blessed. Listen, whoever you are, wherever you are in the country, man, woman, boy, or girl, you have an assignment to keep. Listen to me. I will coach you through this assignment. God has given you an assignment that you have not completed. Many of you are on the territory that you're supposed to be on, just like Dan, just like the Danites. You're on the territory you're supposed to be on, but the enemy has relegated you to operating in just a small portion of it. <laughs> the enemy has intimidated you. He, the enemy has punked you. Ooh, that's, a, that's a sermon. The enemy has punked you. Put, told you you're going to stay in that corner over there and I'm going to take your stuff. I'm taking your cake. I'm taking your French fries. I'm taking your hamburger and you're going to watch me eat it. That's why God would often tell the Israelites, if you do not exterminate them, you are going to regret it because they are going to come back and eventually exterminate you. Are you hearing me, people of God? Are you hearing me? Charles, God bless you, man. Thank you for jumping in here on jumping in here today. Yes, Katrina, you're right. He is a bully. The enemy is a bully. And the enemy's slick too. The enemy will pretend. Because if you really come out serious against the enemy, the enemy will change his tactics. He will pretend to be your friend. He will pretend to be your friend so that you will let your guard down and then he's going to beat your head in. It's called warfare, people of God. We are in war 
warfare. Our families are in war. You're at war and it's not, I told you in the beginning, it is not against your family members. I'll take you back to the scripture. It's not against your family members. The war is not against your family members. It's not against your friends. That's not who the war is against. Deuteronomy chapter 20. This is the promise. The promise went to the Danites, the tribe of Dan. They heard the promise. They got the same instructions all the other tribes got, except they got pushed off their land. What did the scripture say? Again, people of God, let's look at it. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1. What the scripture says, when you go to war, when you go, not if, we said it before, when you go to war, when, when you go to war against your enemies, not your friends, not your brother, not your sister, when you go to war against your enemies, who are we fighting people, God, we're not fighting we're not fighting uh, Barney, the friendly dinosaur. We're fighting someone who wants to take you out. Enemies, people of God. So stop fighting against your family members. They're not your, they're not your enemies. Stop fighting against your friends. Stop. And for churches, we don't do this at New Birth Church, but we've had it in the past where I had members going at one another. We had Ruth and I had to jump in and intervene and, 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 and tell them they need to stop because we're a family. We don't have that mess now. Thank God. And, and as the church grows, though, things happen. When you, you know, pastor can't control everything. I can't control everybody. It gets, it gets more difficult, right? But we've had it in the past where I've had members and I say, but it hits. And I told them, we're not enemies. We're supposed to be fighting. We fight one enemy and it's not each other. And if you're going to a church and you see families pitted against other families, what you need to do is you need to go to the spiritual leadership and tell the spiritual leadership, we're not supposed to be fighting against one another. We need to put the church on the fast because people need to be humbling themselves. They need to be humble. They're too proud. They're arrogant. They think they know it all. And they got enough guts to come into the household of faith and act a fool. They don't, they've never read the Bible about people getting killed for acting a fool in the temple, doing things they shouldn't be doing in the temple, getting slain. They don't, they hadn't read their Bibles, evidently. So I'm gonna end it here. I'm gonna end it here because I'm not done. I'm not done. We're talking about fighting against fear. We fight against our enemies. All right. We fight against our enemies. Let me see. Hello. Well, you know, I'm teaching my Bible class. No, I'm sitting here teaching my Bible class. We're all into it. And, you know, I didn't want to disrespect my wife. Yeah, that's right. I'm, you want me to put you on speakerphone? Because I'm just about to end. Okay. Right. I know you're studying at the library. She goes to the library to study because it's quiet. Uh, uh, Miss Tyson, God bless you. See, I got people on here, Ruth. And I, I got to let you go, hon. I got to teach. All right. Bye. She was at the library studying. She She goes to the library. Um, your enemy is Satan. Keep that up front. Pray against the spirit of Dan. The spirit of Dan has these characteristic traits. I'm going to talk more next week. Miss Tyson, y'all jump back in here. Greenwell, everybody. Crystal Allen, everybody come back next week because I'm not done. Here's some of the characteristics of Dan. They look intimidating. On the outside, they look intimidating on the outside. They were the second largest tribe. That's why they were put in the positioning that they were put into. They were the second largest tribe. They look intimidating. Number one. Number two, inside, 
They were filled with unbelief and doubt because they would not follow through with God's word. Anytime you do not follow through with God's word, you're filled with doubt and unbelief. Donna, God bless you, Donna. Thank you, Donna. Donna, somebody told me you're going to be singing this Sunday. Kevin, God bless you, man. Desmond, I love you. They look intimidating. Dan does, the tribe of Dan. Number two, they're, they're filled with doubt and unbelief. They would not follow God's word. Number three, the real enemy punks them out. Number four, they act as bullies to others who don't in really intimidate them. So we, 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 can, we need to break some of this stuff down next week. All right. Wendell, God bless you, man. Thank you, sir, for serving in the ministry. Wendell has come in new birth and jumped in his spot, at least one spot that I know of. And he is working, working with Brother uh, Gary outside, getting the cars parked on Sundays. And uh, he's going to be doing some other things too. Brother Wendell, God bless you. Thank you. Hey, that's it for today. I'm telling you, uh, I've taken enough of your time, but I believe God is, is speaking to us. I am trying to move the people of God and get you away from a fearful heart so you can take that territory you're supposed to be taking. You know what Paul told Timothy. You all know the scripture too well. God hath not given us the what? Spirit of fear. He didn't give us the spirit of fear. It's a spirit of fear. All right? The spirit of fear. And we got to get out of here. So you're not going to have a fearful heart. That's what we're working on. Because if fear will always move you away from faith, of course, Fear will all, always remove you from your inheritance. Fear will always drive you to territory, to people, to land, to projects that you have no business in. All right. Yes, a sound mind. Yes. Amen. All right, we're going to get out of here. Let's get some shout outs before we go. We got to go and let you guys get back to work. And uh, I'll call Ruth back to see what she was trying to do and what she's trying to what she was trying to say, I don't know what she's trying to do with interrupting my Bible class and everything. Lord, have mercy. Y'all need to pray for your first lady. That's what you need to do. You need to be praying for it. All right. Praise God. I want to thank everyone for on being with us on Facebook. And for those of you who are watching us on YouTube, our YouTube side is growing also. Uh, Facebook has always been there. But I want to thank you guys for being in here and uh being in the building. Praise God. All right. Y'all take care. I love you guys. All right. Oh, Jesus Christ. Why didn't y'all? Okay. I thought you guys liked me. I'm disappointed in all of you. All of you should be ashamed of yourself. Sister Donna, all of you. Martina, all of you. All of you should be, a, Crystal is one of my ministers. She is over the new members class and she didn't even remind me. All of you should be ashamed of yourself. Katrina, all of you should be, Rhonda too. I'm, I'm disappointed. I really am. I think I'm just going to end the stream right now and not even tell you what I'm disappointed about because it hurt. Evangelist, I'm just, I'm really, evangelist, as much as you pray, you should have known this. Evangelist is our prayer leader. She should. This Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. And nobody said, Pastor, okay, Cornita just <laughs> Cornita just put it up. She figured it out. <laughs> it's Resurrection Sunday, y'all. It's Resurrection Sunday. Come on, y'all. If y'all don't come out no other day, okay? You got to be the CME. Christmas, what is it? Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. You got to come out Easter. We call it Resurrection Sunday. It's been on the ticker the whole time, and I didn't even mention it. Y'all didn't even, I don't think anybody said anything about it. I don't think. Phyllis Keelan, y'all didn't remind me that it's you, I was supposed to tell everyone it's Resurrection Sunday and invite everyone to church. Katrina says she's going to be there, y'all. Ooh, it's going to be packed in the house now because Katrina's going to be there. Y'all better spread the word. 
Katrina, I was, you shouldn't have said anything. I was going to keep it a secret. And I knew what you were saying. You said something. I said, I can't wait to Katrina come in the house. And I was giving you little wink winks on Sly. I wasn't trying to tell everybody else. And you done let the cat out of the bag. Jesus Christ. Katrina, you just spoil the surprise. Everybody know they weren't supposed to know. I already knew. I knew. Ruth knew. Pastor Harris knew, but we weren't going to tell anybody else. But y'all, okay, since y'all on light lunch, shh, Katrina's going to try to make it to church this Sunday. But don't tell. Paula said, our lips are sealed. Shh. Paula, we're still praying for Maddie too now. Shh. What did, what did Aunt Helen say? Y'all having other conversations on here. Shh. Don't tell anyone else. All right. All right. I'm going to let y'all go. We had fun today. I really enjoy teaching the word of God. And, uh, this platform allows me to be Pastor Mike. It's a different platform than what's in the pulpit. It's just different. It's hard to explain it, but it's different. So it's different. And I like it. I like this platform. What did Patrice say? Patrice says you can't do that. <coughs> what, what are they talking about? Great time to, yeah, great time with everybody. And I love y'all. Y'all enjoy the rest of the day. And I'm going to get out of here. All right. Don't tell anyone else that Katrina is planning on being at church Sunday. It's a secret.